Emily Carr's Clee Wick, Chapter 16, Friends. We have a good house now. We would like you to stay with us when you come. My third stepfather gave me the house when he was dead. He was a good man. I wrote back, I would like to stay with you in your house. Louisa met me down on the mud flats. She had to walk out a half mile because the tide was low. She wore gumboots and carried another pair in her hand for me. Her two small barefoot sons took my bags on their backs. Louisa's greetings were gracious and suitable to the dignity of her third stepfather's house. It was a nice house and had a garden and veranda. There was a large kitchen, a living room, and double parlors. The back parlor was given to me. It had a handsome brass bed with spread and pillow slips heavily embroidered and an eiderdown. There was also a fine dresser in the room. On it stood a candle in a beer bottle and a tin pie plate to hold hairpins. There was lots of light and air in the room because the blind would not draw down and the window could not shut up. A big chest in the center of the room held the best clothes of all the family. Everyone was due to dress there for church on Sunday morning. Between my parlor and the front parlor was an archway hung with skimpy purple curtains of plush. If any visitors came for music in the evenings and stayed too long, Louisa said, you must go now, my friend wants to go to bed. The outer parlor ran to music. It had a player piano, an immense instrument with a volume that rocked the house, an organ, a flute, and some harmonicas. When the cabinet for the player rolls, the bench, a big sofa, a stand lamp with a shade and some rocking chairs got into the room. There was scarcely any space for people. In the living room stood a glass case and in it were Louisa's and Jimmy's wedding presents and all their anniversary presents. They had been married a long time, so the case was quite full. The kitchen was comfortable with a fine cook stove, a sink and a round table to eat off. Louisa had been cook in a cannery and cooked well. Visitors often came in to watch us eat. They just slipped in and sat in chairs against the wall, and we went on eating. Mrs. Green, Louisa's mother, dropped in very often. Louisa's house was the best house in the village. At night, Louisa's boys, Jim and Joe, opened a funny little door in the living room wall and disappeared. Their footsteps sounded up and more up, a creak on each step, and then there was silence. By and by, Jimmy and Louisa disappeared through the little door, too. Only they made louder creaks as they stepped. The house was then quite quiet, just the waves sighing on the shore. Louisa's mother, Mrs. Green, was a remarkable woman. She clung vigorously to the old Indian ways, which sometimes embarrassed Louisa. In the middle of talking, the old lady would spit on the wood pile behind the stove. When Louisa, saw she was go saw, when Louisa saw she was going to, she ran with a newspaper, but she seldom got there in time. She was a little ashamed, too, of her mother smoking a pipe, but Louisa was most respectful to her mother, and she never scolded her. One day, I was passing the cabin in the village where Mrs. Green lived. I saw the old lady standing barefoot in a trunk, which was filled with thick brown kelp leaves dried hard. They were covered with tiny gray eggs. Louisa told me it was fish roe and was much relished by the Japanese. Mrs. Green knew where the fish put their eggs in the beds of kelp, and she went out in her canoe and got them. After she had dried them, she sent them to the store in Prince Rupert, and the store shipped them to Japan, giving Mrs. Green value in goods. When Mrs. Green had tramped the kelp flat, Louisa and I sat on the trunk, and she roped it and did up the clasps. Then we put the trunk on the boy's little wagon and between us trundled it to the wharf. They came home then to write a letter to the store man at Prince Rupert. Louisa got the pen and ink and her black head and her mother's gray one bent over the kitchen table. They had the store catalog. It was worn soft and black. Mrs. Green had been deciding all the year what to get with the money from the fish row. Louisa's tongue kept lolling out of the corner of her mouth as she worried over the words. She found them harder to write than to say in English. 
It seemed as if, she, as if the lolling tongue made it easier to put them on the paper. Can I help you? I asked. Louisa shoved the paper across the table to me with a glad sigh, crushing up her scrawled sheet. They referred over and over to the catalog, telling me what to write. One plaid shawl with fringe, a piece of pink print, a yellow silk handkerchief, groceries were all written down, but the old woman kept turning back the catalog and Louisa kept turning it forward again and saying firmly, that is all you need, mother. Still, the old woman's fingers kept stealthily slipping back the pages with longing. I ended the letter and left room for something else on the list. Was there anything more you wanted, Mrs. Green? Yes, me like that, she said with a defiant glance at Louisa. It was a patent tobacco pipe with a little tin lid. Louisa looked ashamed. What a fine pipe, Mrs. Green. You ought to have that, I said. Me like little smoke, said Mrs. Green, looking slyly at Louisa. That night, old Mother Green sat by the stove, puffing happily on her old clay pipe. She leaned forward and poked my knee. That lid good, she said. When me small, small girl, me mama tell me, go fetch pipe often. I put it in my mouth to keep the fire. That way, me begin like smoke. She had a longish face, scribbled all over with wrinkles. When she talked English, the big wrinkles around her eyes and mouth were seams deep and tight with, and little wrinkles, like stitches, crossed them. The candle in my room gave just enough light to show off the darkness. Morning made clear the picture that was opposite my bed. It was of three very young infants. How they could stick up so straight with no support at that age was surprising. They had embroidered robes three times as long as themselves and the most amazing expressions on their faces. Their six eyes were shut as tight as licked envelopes. The infants, clearly, had tremendous wills and had determined never to open their eyes. Their little faces were like those of very old people. Their fierce wrinkles seemed to catch and pinch my stares so that I could not get it away. I stared and stared. Louisa found me staring. I said, whose babies are those? Mother's triples, she replied, replied grandly. You mean they were Mrs. Green's babies? Yes, the only triples ever born on Queen Charlotte Islands. Did they die? One died and the other two never lived. We kept the dead ones till the live one died. Then we pictured them all together. Whenever I saw that remarkable old woman with her hoe and spade starting off in her canoe to cultivate the potatoes she grew wherever she could find a pocket of earth on the little islands round about, I thought of the triples. If they had lived and had inherited her strength and determination, they could have rocked the Queen Charlotte Islands.